hundreds and hundreds of miles. Yeah, for it, so yes. yeah it does. Yeah, absolutely. I don't see a big flat plateau on this seamount, so. There's some pink hemicorallians and some smaller uh, recruits mm. as well. The, there's another dead bamboo coral skeleton. It with could be a trawl net, actually, Asako said, mm. and then I looked it up. Sorry to interrupt you. Yeah, yeah, no. Um, and looking at pictures, it is that same kind of orange okay. fine net. Really? Yeah. That's interesting. I think it thought it would have been more uh, robust. But maybe but it could have drifted from yeah, elsewhere. That a yeah. trawl net that's used for shallower depths, but it just drifted yeah, and sunk. Yeah. Not absolutely not hefty enough for the deeper seafloor trawling nets. Another one of uh, another black coral. Difficult to say whether it's a bathy bathies, alternate bathies, or any apparently bathies from here, but a black coral indeed. Oh, that's good to learn. Yeah. Some upside down hanging coral colonies, probably from Lloyd's. I think we're good for another uh, move north. Yutina also says that uh, those are bathy patties again. Oh, that's a nice anemone. And here we are also seeing some dead skeleton with hydroids overgrowing them. It's a serious drop. I'm not even uh, getting altitude now. It's probably over 70 meters. If you have a second Upasana, yes, we had a absolutely. visitor, a uh, viewer, ask um, why, oh, a sea star, sea star, red sea star. Oh, yeah, it looks goniastrid from a distance, can be the similar kind, the uh, genus Hippasta. Uh, that we saw previously feeding on the corals, looks like a family looks to be in the family Goni Asterid. Do a quick zoom there, please. Oh, it's probably feeding on the hydroids, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it looks like, hey, too much now, I need a nap. It's one arm over seven, taking a little siesta before resuming feeding on the hydroids again. Yes, sorry. Carol, you had a... Oh, yeah. Okay, um, you can go in, thanks. A viewer was just asking about um, why the black coral is black, because they kind of look orange. Um, do you want to explain a little bit more about that? Well, yeah, it's absolutely. Uh, they get I'm going to drop down the cliff here while we're waiting for the boat. Black, because their skeleton is black in color and it's a proteinaceous skeleton and all members have this very uh, distinct black skeleton that we can see every time that uh, we see a black coral so hence the name and uh, most black corals are as far as i know they are generally uh, orangish in color uh, the tissue is orangish in color but the color is the name doesn't come from the color of the tissue but the skeleton because the skeleton uh, thing one uh, hypothesis can be that previous like earlier collections were all trawling collections right and these exude color over time or when they're brought up from Look the sea but the skeletons they come retain the come color this so here. that could have been right. why they got yeah, familiar yeah. name black corals because you don't really see completely black skeletons in other that corals makes sense, so yeah. Thanks. You're welcome. Yeah, 
Yeah, the Hephaestus. Mm. Spiky sea star. I think the Hephaestus, I'm not sure. I would love somebody to confirm this, but I think they are mostly found uh, feeding on uh, like bamboo that. corals a lot of the times at least. Well, that is getting yeah. ready to let go. I wonder if I jumped on it. But I don't know if they only feed on the bamboo corals, but I think they generally feed on others as well. But I can't hear you. Yes, but they're like very commonly seen on bamboo corals, feeding on the bamboo corals. They all look like we are tired from eating and need a nap. <laughs> <laughs> Another one of the Bolosoma sponges. These have all been of a certain size. You know, that other dive on the other seamount, they were so large. Yeah. Mm. Is that a black coral as Yes, well? yes. Very I long one? Yeah, it, it would be the one similar to the bottle brush, like black coral that we were having a look at before. They kind of look like feathers to me. Yes. <laughs> really wishing I would have put the uh, sexton camera on there now. The bubble camera has been able to see the whole front of the vehicle and probably 10, 20 meters below us. There are some um, mushroom corals as well. Something small and orangish, probably zoanthids. Yeah, I just think greater diversity on these vertical and under, yeah. under crevice overhangs on the underneath side. I think it just Something's not liking the top sediments. Yeah, because I think it increases the surface area in terms of the water current that's flowing in. Because they're flowing in like this. Uh, More about water current than yeah. sedimentation. Could it be yeah. the upwelling coming up? Bringing up nutrients? Uh, and just settling? Uh, upwelling. Upwelling is more prominent in the... So that's that would be like deeper layers of water being brought up in the upper surfaces. Yeah. So the deeper currents here, so the deep water currents are definitely more nutritious, sometimes have contained more uh, nutrients necessary because they are sinking from uh, the, the upper layers in, in the uh, yeah. more polar regions and then flowing in. Uh, but I, I think this is very little of a depth difference between the top and the sides, like right here, we what we are seeing. But uh, I'm only familiar with upwelling where you have the, the, mm -hmm. you know, the northerly current off of California yeah. headed south, That's and then the Coriolis yeah, effect out. turns it to the right, and there's yes. a relative vacuum, and so really the deep cold water well, comes, comes up, up right off the California the pressure, coast. Yes, yeah, the water pressure. Some faded sponges, reflectolids, bolosoma. Does the deep ocean follow the same gyres that we know for? I mean, does it extend through the whole water column, or does the deep ocean have a different set of currents running through it? Um, yes and no. I mean, overall, the similar. Uh, phenomenon mm -hmm. but not the same currents necessarily okay. it depends from place remember to place. these numbers 20 meters at 2313 gram there's a gram leaf yeah. in some places there are deeper water currents because they're mostly sinking from know, the polar regions altitude because of higher density because the ice is uh, the ice layers are forming in the top and, and so there's so the salinity is higher there and <laughs> more salinity higher density so it sinks 
and then it flows uh, in the towards the upper latitude. Yeah, you can so tell. that's why they have very high concentration in nutrients. Wow. So it's again under the effect of the similar uh, Coriolis effect and everything that's the same. But the currents differ. And it's been a while since I have yeah, gone well, back to my ocean current. Yeah, oceanography is yeah. Uh, its whole other discipline. Yeah. But I love that. I love the relation to Atlanta by the camera there angle there. Uh, several classes of oceanography, and I really enjoy it. Yeah, yeah, also the. But it's been a while, USB so OSMIR. I can't really remember all the finer terms. But yeah, I think. Um, when I learned about it, they called it the ocean conveyor belt. I yes, think that yeah, was what you're yeah, describing. Exactly, yes. And it's pretty cool. Like, basically, all the oceans are connected and the water's flowing between them. And yeah. it takes all about right, a thousand years to complete that journey. Um, Because of that ocean conveyor belt, it also, one of the most important functions of the ocean for our Earth is also to transport heat yes, heat um, into different absolutely. areas, yeah. And uh, transport of heat, transport of carbon that is sequestered in the upper layer. Right. It plays a major role in heat transfer and the climatic conditions of the terrestrial parts of the world. Does it look yeah. like all of these are dead bamboos here? Sorry? Do these all look like dead bamboo corals to yeah. you? Yeah, the stalks of dead bamboo, yeah. the bases of dead bamboos. And it's amazing why there are so many of them. I, I don't know, maybe uh, when they reach a certain size, there's a competition or not everybody is strong enough to yeah, sustain them. Yeah, clearly in this area. Yeah. yeah, in that angle. But the whole fasts remain. Yeah, yeah it seems here. like everything here is just skeletons. Yeah. yeah, and a different, it looks like a different community on the top to me than yeah. the vertical and deep surfaces. Absolutely. Yeah. This is more spooky. Your highlight should be like spookier. Yeah, with the white <laughs> barren branches, yeah. It's like a dead forest. Is that a oh no, that's a it's like hiking through a formerly burned out section of yeah. trail. Oh, yeah. That, that's, yeah, that's right. There's something on the seafloor, probably a small black coral again. Or, yeah, a batty batties again. Do you see it? Oh, Pashana, yeah. you're a bit quiet. Oh, I sorry. Yes. Right. Did the classic... Uh, Move the microphone away while sipping tea and <laughs> yes, the lily patties are the parenti patties and the bati patties again. Bati patties or uh, quick zoom there for some pseudo alternata. Okay. That's great. That's a great zoom. Mm. Most of the bamboo corals here are, and we are seeing more of dead skeletons and okay. lots of hydroids overgrowing them. Try another move on Argus's heading, which is uh, 40. Yes, uh, yes, please. 
How far are we from uh, waypoint two so I can kind of mark where these dead bamboo corals are? Yeah, let me give you that. Uh, give me a second. Yeah, no problem. We're just about 230 meters away. Thank you. No worries. So we have a lot of new viewers joining us. Um, from Argentina, Belgium, um, Brunei, Switzerland, France, Hungary, India, Korea, Lebanon, Norway, Portugal, Singapore, Australia, Canada, Germany, United, the UK, uh, Japan, and the US. Thank you so much for um, joining this dive. Um, just a little update. Um, we are currently on a Another unnamed seamount in Papahanaumo Kuakea Marine National Monument. Um, this seamount is about 85 nautical miles northwest of um, Kure Atoll. And um, right now uh, we're doing both uh, kind of geology and biology objectives. Um, the geology is um, going to sample some rocks to determine uh -huh. whether the seamount formed over the Hawaiian hotspot or whether it's Cretaceous in origin. And um, our biological observations and samples will also help us understand the communities uh, living in these areas. Um, so far, we've been seeing a lot of bamboo corals on the dive. Um, been looking at uh, some dead, ba dead bamboo corals recently. Um, some interesting communities under the overhang um, under the undersides, I guess, of the ledges of some of these rock formations. And then also some black corals in the area. So um, thanks for tuning in and um, hopefully we're gonna continue seeing some more interesting um, biology and geology and landscapes on this dive. Uh, if you're tuning in on YouTube, feel free to also head to um, nautiluslive.org um, and you can see some more information, such as um, our current depth, which is about 7,580 feet, um, the water temperature, wind speed, other information, and um, you can also send comments and questions, and we'll try our best to answer them um, and get to them when we can. So thanks for joining. Glass sponge? Yes, uh, yeah. glass sponges, euplectelids, uh, yeah. mostly. All right, yeah, we're good for another uh, two zero there. We haven't seen a lot of those. No, but uh, I think along the vertical walls, we have yeah. been seeing them a little bit more than. I don't think we saw any on the yeah. flatter surface. Like the top parts of the of these ledges. Roger, what bearing is that? Roger, good for another forty. That's an impressive list of countries tuning in. 
It's really wonderful. Some of which I've been to, the rest of which I would like to go. Really? Yeah? Sure. Um, which, which have you been to <laughs> on this really long list? And changing, we now also have Costa Rica. Welcome, viewers from Costa Rica. Rescinded. You'll have to scan up Singapore. Mm, yeah. Canada. Mm -hmm. uh, Australia. United Kingdom. Japan. Wow. Awesome. United States? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my mom's probably watching. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, Taylor Ann's mom. <laughs> yeah, I think my parents are also watching. Those are the hits from India. <laughs> Yeah, when there's a pull-out flag on the screen, it's most likely either my family or one of my coworkers <laughs> are doing it. <laughs> and my mom sent me a screenshot of uh, us working in the lab Did last really? night. Yeah. Oh, they were. <laughs> yeah. Aww, yeah. Nice. We were halfway through, actually we're almost done processing all the samples and then Virginia came in and said, oh yeah, we're on the wet lab is Streaming live. <laughs> they always stream. Oh. Yeah, you know, processing samples on there. Oh, okay. Yeah, sometimes they'll give us a heads up, but yeah. not always. Which <laughs> <laughs> is fine. Yeah, I was gonna say the second you guys start grabbing samples, you're on camera. <laughs> yeah, just don't fall. <laughs> and just don't have the audio on. Because by that time we are very tired and confused, <laughs> especially if it's like five in the morning. Oh yeah. After a long night. Yeah, that's very helpful to have a big team in there supporting that the efforts of processing all those samples. It makes it a lot easier. Yeah, it just makes it a lot faster, also. Yeah, and it's better to have more eyes on the same yeah. thing and make sure yeah. you don't make mistakes. You mentioned um, Guam earlier. A friend of mine is the maritime archaeologist there, University oh, of Guam. Really? Dr. Bill Jeffrey. Very cool. Yep, very good archaeologist. Yeah, so many right, archaeological can, uh, sites keep it there. Moving. Maritime archaeological sites, Kara? Yeah, I feel like there's some um, shipwrecks there, and um, um, I forget which one I. When I was like practicing free diving. Mm -hmm. I think it might have been like American tanker. Oh, wow. I think they also sank a bunch of um, like concrete barges at some point to oh, wow. create uh, like a breakwater. So, um, and those are just the few that I know of, and mm -hmm. it's not my specialty. So, um, I'm I'm sure there's like way more, and well, I don't there know are many. the field. Yeah, there are many. So there are you know, some of the Manila galleons, Spanish galleons, wow. have been lost to Guam. Mm -hmm. Right, yeah. Yeah, because I think it falls on uh, one of the more famous uh, travel routes. The galleon routes? Yeah. Yeah. From the trading Acapulco yeah. Yeah. to Manila, starting about 1565, exactly. going through about 1815. Yeah, yeah. I think I remember from Gua I'm not Chamorro or Guamanian, but I think I remember from what I've learned from friends is that Guam is actually has been the oldest continually colonized uh, country in the Pacific. So um, mm. while a lot of the other Pacific countries um, fall, fell under like foreign rule in the 1800s, they actually started in the 1500s so in Guam, Guam, in the yeah. Marianas Islands. Yeah. 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 I didn't the know Spanish. That. Magellan. Mm -hmm. Magellan. Magellan was the first. Supposedly. Squat lobster. <laughs> squat lobster. Magellan was the first squat lobster. Magellan was, squat lobster. Lobster. Magellan was not a squat lobster. No, no. <laughs> he could never. <laughs> That's why the Chamorro language is very close to Spanish. Jake, can you um, turn up your yeah. uh, mic a little bit? It's hard to hear. Oh. Sorry, like the mic is away from my mouth. Um, yeah, I was told um, Magellan is a big part of um, like language, Chamorro. Mm. A lot of it is, resembles um, Spanish, like the way we count. Chamorro mm. is very similar. 
Yeah, and I think people also say like buenos, like buenos, or, yeah, buenos, buenos, um, as well as half a day. So there's a lot of, um, I think, learning you can, from. You can uh, plug in another one. Yeah. This uh, amazing historian at the Guam Museum, uh, he said, there's a lot of elements of um, Spanish and Japanese in Chamorro language as well. So is that also um, something in Palau? Because I remember I went to the museum, um, the Palau National Museum, I think it was called. Uh, and zoom in there for a minute. It break. showed like um, influence from like Germany and all sorts of countries that came through, yeah. Yeah, so Palau's history. Oh. Is squat lobster? That falls it? Is it squat lobster? Sort of a bigger cool. one. It's Magellan, or the squat lobster. <laughs> or a crab. Oh, it's upside down. Yeah. It's hanging like yeah. this. Yeah. Yeah, it's a squat lobster. Sorry, I'll say I. Oh, no, no, it's fine. Yeah, it's hanging upside down. The Olympic gymnast of the squat lobsters. <laughs> Yeah, so yes. um, Palau um, fell under four different colonial rules. So it started with the Spanish, uh, and which was then, uh, Palau was then sold to the Germans. And the Germans did quite a lot of mining, um, especially in our southern islands. They mined for bauxite, so, which is, um, I think it's made out of the, ba the bad, or I'm thinking, sorry, I'm thinking okay. of different. Okay, go on. Yeah, but they Fertilizer. did that mining too as well. Thank you. And then from um, Germany, of course, in World War II, Palau was a under Japanese rule. And um, that was actually in my grandparents' lifetime. So my grandparents went to Japanese schools and they spoke Ten Japanese. Ten meters left. Wow. Yeah, right. and then... Um, we were then underneath the United States, um, along with a couple of other countries in Micronesia, which is in the Western Pacific, and it was called the Trust Territory of the Pacific Islands. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and Guam. So that was Guam, Palau, Saipan, um, Pohnpei, Yap, Marshall Islands, Kosrae, uh, Chuk. Yeah, so quite a lot of countries. And then um, Palau gained independence in 1994. Yeah, so we're now That's an independent nation. Yeah. Wow. It's quite a history. Yeah. yeah. Thank you for explaining that. Thanks so much for sharing that. Yeah, we learn uh, learned all of that in our civics class in elementary school. So, <laughs> yeah. So we do have some different um, words from different languages in our language. Yeah, so there must have been a lot of uh, intermixing when it comes to language and food and culture, yeah. probably. So our word for priest is padre, mm. which is sp Spanish. padre. Our word for bell is cambalang, which is, I think, also from a Spanish word. And we have a lot of, we have a lot of Japanese, so... Yeah, and also probably German influences in some... There is German, but I'm not aware of as many okay. and I don't know why that might have been yeah because I know during the Spanish time they had a lot of missionaries yeah. yeah so yeah very interesting it's all a part of our history um, like Kara said it's in our museum and ki um, growing up children in Palau are taught about our history and then um, we still do have our own language and our own culture so we're very proud of that and I'm happy to be here as a Palauan out here in the mm, Hawaiian Ocean. Yeah. Um, right. And very honored to be in a place that's special to Native Hawaiians because I have a very special relationship to my country. So, mm. yeah. Thanks so much for sharing, Elsie. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, thank you. We're really happy to have you here representing and informing us and teaching us this yeah. history. And it's very important that we know that as we explore this specific um, and we know the true move. history of the islands around. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and our story is not unique. All, all the Pacific move, Islands yeah. have their own histories and cultures. What's and up? Um, I'm very happy to be from a place as diverse as the Pacific Islands. That will yeah. take us off and of this feature. Time, it is also important to uh, remember and recognize yeah, that's these fine. histories and not just. Uh, really, this back row, can I jump in there for a minute? Yeah. Uh, 
You want to tell them what we're doing here, just so they know we're gonna. We're probably all right with it, just so they know. Um. Sometimes they want to stay on the feature. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so for the back row, yes. they're the waypoints, the track that the team wanted to go was mm -hmm. up this this area that had the wider contour. Okay. Yep, we see it. So we've been along the ridge, and that's where a lot of interesting stuff has been. Okay. But I wanted to make sure we got back over here, because I think part of the plan was to see what is here. Okay. Uh, on the on, on the way to waypoint two. Yep. Um, okay. So I didn't want to just miss that. We've been having a nice view kind of coming up. Yeah. So it might be barren, but. Well, that's the track. It's yeah, that's okay. going to waypoint yeah. two. I've I've heard things uh, there are nice. <laughs> you always say that. <laughs> I hear things up there are spooky. <laughs> I feel like we had a comment from. I heard it's um, a point on a map between two lines. <laughs> Someone who said, goth girl here loving the spooky coral forest. <laughs> Love that comment. <laughs> yeah, I remember a pair of green pants in a Dr. Seuss book that went out into a spooky forest. I don't know if you guys were raised with those. Back in the day, we had them. You can uh, rehome the DBL now that we're back over solid ground. We yep. have around an hour and 15 minutes left in our watch. Yeah. So it's been an interesting dive so far. Uh, dominated by bamboo corals with some primnoid fans. It's going to um, be um, downhill for a while, so you're not going to get a very good view here. Okay. No problem. Yep, the middle middle watch, or otherwise known as the dead man's watch, yes. that, that we're on. And I thank you for including that history. Oh, I'll say it's still fine. And then just fixing something. Yeah. Sorry, go ahead. Are you good? Hopefully that sounds a bit better. Yeah, I yeah, didn't yeah. have the <laughs> No worries. Just oh the squishy thing. I didn't have the squishy on my <laughs> mic. Um. Yeah. Technical terms again. Very <laughs> <laughs> scientific terms. Yeah. Uh, but I just say thank you for that that history because even though I mean, we've had a his history section on this mission, of course, and have finished that. And now we're looking at biology and geology in a special location. But, you know, even though we're looking at these seamounts and natural resources, where we are always has history and human connection. And, you know, for us here, it's, it's the Marine Monument, Papahanaumokuakea, and um, it's a very special cultural and strong connection to Native Hawaiian peoples. But in other places, in the South Pacific and Western Pacific, as you mentioned, there's important history. And it's, uh, it's the context of, of, of where we are. Yeah. And you mentioned the, the, the German influence and Japanese influence that occurred a lot in a lot of other places in World War I. And the Japanese were our, our allies. And, and after the war, those German colonies in the Pacific were kind of put under the trust of Japan by the League of Nations. So there are patterns that influenced your home Good and for another a, a lot of other places in, in the Pacific, South and Western Pacific. Thank you, Hans. It's great to have a historian and archeologist on our watch to give that context. And I know we do have a lot of wrecks in Palau as well. Mm -hmm. um, but, and I don't know if this is, I don't know if there's like a professional archaeological view on using wrecks as dive sites, um, but a lot of them are Sorry, some I missed of the bearing me on what? Roger. 
some of them are uh, there, our most popular dive sites. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's quite appropriate and and useful, and can be done in a responsible way. Some sites are more sensitive than others. Sometimes there are reasons not to have you know access to certain sites, but you know many many can be enjoyed. Is this a sea cucumber we're yes. seeing? Uh, yes, this is so a definitely a sea cucumber. We there's actually the boat two. To Argus in the deeper water. Uh, there's one and there's a smaller one on the left. I think the left is definitely a cyanolactid. Or uh, uh, I can just come back up one the hill, I'm one and the checking. other. checking. Can be a cyanolactid as well. I think it's a cyanolactid also. So uh, just keep going the way you want to go. I'll I'll uh, move her back up the hill. to stay to the left so you can do whatever. I got a little carried away there and came down the hill. I should be on the shallow side. I never knew there were so many different looking sea cucumbers. I always yeah, you can keep them moving. It looks pretty benign. A handful any. of shallow water sea cucumbers. It's be downhill for a while. So yeah. Until we drop back down into the valley. Very elegant looking. Like the purple, uh, yeah, the, the purple ah. fade. Yeah, this one. So, a cyanolactid in the genus of uh, Peolopag. I can't pronounce it. Peolopagitis. Okay. <laughs> I only know that because I was on last year with a sea cucumber expert. And Can you repeat that? Peolopagitis. Yeah, uh, Peolopagitis. Palopatitis. I don't know what its common name is. <laughs> yeah, sea cucumber. I don't think they have, <laughs> other than the headless chicken monster, which is tiny <laughs> and it measters. <laughs> Palopatitis. I think now the feed will hear all of us just r r trying to chime in this genus name and practicing. <laughs> Are the. Um, sort of piles that we see at the very left yeah some it's um it's what's it eaten yeah, or what it's ingested yeah, yeah. yeah. it's the intestine and you're just full of sediment and there's a small pink one of the right yeah. next to mm. it yeah okay, look what but these are not the fl is it only the headless chicken monster that flies or <laughs> <laughs> no, I think there are several uh, the in ones. that family which uh, can swim like that. Okay. A couple okay. of them, or they can be the same genus. Let me check. Uh, yeah, some of them look like they have more like bunny ears. Yeah. On mm -hmm. the, I think they call it a sail. Uh, I think probably the same genus, different species, but mm -hmm. there are also others that can uh, swim. I think these can swim also. Like these can swim? Okay. Not these. Oh, not, not these. these. No, no, no. 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 Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. And for any viewers. They can just float away a bit, probably. Yeah. I'm not sure. Not th those kind. For any viewers confused about what we're talking about with chicken monsters, <laughs> um, just check out uh, our YouTube um, page. Um, on a previous expedition, uh, we saw. Moment. A pretty uh, amazing, striking, beautiful, um, like dark red right. sea cucumber. Yeah. A flying sea cucumber. <laughs> Flapping through the water, and um, there's some really great clips on it. So Without definitely. A head. Yeah, given how beautiful they are, I do not like the name headless chicken monster. <laughs> they yeah. really look very elegant. They look yes. more like uh, to be like you know ballet dancers who are just swimming. Yeah, like the Spanish dancers, oh. you know that oh, one. No, 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 we're going with that name. That is a <laughs> I think that it, other <laughs> are they related to the Spanish dancer? Oh. The other, the sea creature? No idea. 
Um, so oh, Spanish it's such, it's such dancers are, yeah, Dora Nudebrink. Okay, so Nudebrink, yeah. I didn't know which ones are called the Spanish dancers. And um, quick correction, I'm not sure if the Headless Chicken Monster video is on our YouTube page, but if you just Google Headless Chicken Monster, <laughs> it will definitely Sorry. come up. So the scientific name is Enaps. Enipniastis. Enipniastis. Yeah. Yeah. Enipniastis, Enipniustis, the various variations in the pronunciation. Mm -hmm. We had a question about if Hercules and Atalanta were made um, specially for these purposes and custom made and um, to the short answer to that I believe is yes a lot of pretty much everything on Hercules is um, specially engineered and um, custom designed and um, it does work Hercules I believe the limit um, for its depth is about 4,000 meters. Yeah, Hercules got a lot of upgrades this past season, too. It's a mm. lot taller than it used to be. I think it got new syntactic foam on the top. Oh, nice. Um, and a lot of other outfitting. I think the frame is entirely different, if I'm wow. not mistaken. Um, wow. So if you were placing the frame, did you have to take everything off the old frame and then put everything on the new frame? Yeah, I'm, I'm assuming they had to. Yeah, I'm not wow. sure. Um, but yeah, I would assume so. Well, we had to drill a few holes to make that happen. A few hundred holes. <laughs> <laughs> if you go on the Nautilus TikTok, there's a video of Delta Dan showing the all <laughs> the new things that Hercules Ooh. has. Oh, thanks, really? Dan. Yeah, <laughs> you don't remember making that video? No, I don't remember. Hey guys, I'm Delta Dan, and I'm going to show you all the new things on Hercules. <laughs> How much you need to show to us that video? That. I'm not on TikTok. But I, I have to watch to it 10 times that. just to. <laughs> I'm going to look it up now after yeah. I watch. Oh Can you send us the link? I didn't authorize that video. Hercules is actually two inches wider and two inches tighter with a new aluminum frame. Thank you, Dan. We are intrigued. And thank you, Jacob, Jake, for uh, letting us know about that. <laughs> Dan's never going to do another right. TikTok now. <laughs> Taylor Ann, we've still got a ways to go until we get the next rock sample, or in the area anyway, for Val, but they, I know they got a Niskin sample probably at the start of the dive. Yeah, uh, that where was are the we at? first sample. Um, Have we come a ways to take another one or not yet? Um, let me read the description about that Niskin sample and see what diversity they were seeing, if it's very similar. Yeah, yeah, that's a good idea. Um, yeah, it seems like they mostly we're seeing bamboo corals as well so very similar okay. environment we don't so need them yeah yeah a lot less diversity and shifts and diversity and density yeah. on this dive yeah but no. still large bamboo still corals. large fans density in some patches are, are very high and even the density in the lesser dense parts are also quite high in a deep sea environment it's just that we have been spoiled in the last couple of yeah. dives? I would say so, yeah. 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 In comparison to all dives I've ever been on, yeah, exactly. we're still seeing yes. dense uh, populations. Tons of sugar, exactly. And there's a small coralid uh, octocoral there, a couple of anthomastids on the little mound. Uh, I think one or two anthomastids, or pseudo anthomastids, any one of those. Um, yeah. Yeah, even water samples and rock samples, you know, we recognize we're in a special place. And Absolutely. so we're careful not to take samples unless, you know, there's an important need and it, it's the right time and just the right amount. Absolutely. Push it there. Is this a... It looks like a jelly fish. Oh. Mm -hmm. It does. It is. A Whoop. <laughs> There's another 
sea cucumber on the sea floor there. Oh, and the oh. purple. Evasive maneuvers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Hans, thanks Take for <laughs> bringing that up. And I think an important reframe that our um, colleagues from Hawaii also reminded us is that they view all of the organisms here as their kupuna or their elders. So when we're zooming on an organism, um, it's also, I like to remember that for them, these are um, very important and special creatures to them. So we get excited, but we also um, do have that respect and the honor for what we're seeing on the screen. Right. Yes, and also as a general, uh, again, there are, there are two uh, sea cucumbers, sorry. Uh, as right. general ethical scientific practices, I feel that our main goal is to learn more about these yeah, places, going, learn yeah. more about any such place, even if it is in any other part of the world, and it in the least destructive way possible. And the advancement of technology has allowed us to do that now, and the drive should be to improve technology more in the direction where uh, it is even less destructive uh, as we go ahead in time. And the museums, the repositories, there are tons and thousands of samples there and it sh anything that sh we are collecting should be maybe if it's a new observation from that region or probably a new species. If we already have samples of those then it is always better to have uh, use what we already have in our collections than collecting more and we i mean there, there, there's a rational there's a balance obviously if it is necessary then yes but how and over over our history the way we look at science the way we look at the research has changed and it has to keep improving and i'm glad that it is improving the goal should always be as destructive and as intrusive as possible and this is why such image data for uh, habitats which are inaccessible or less accessible even in other uh, even if terrestrial uh, habitats it's very important to keep that in mind and how we design experiments how we de design our studies uh, it's just a layback protecting habitats moving. and conservation is way yeah. more important than figuring out uh, scientific questions because we want to I couldn't them. say what's too far what's not I just know that if you stop the ship it's we're gonna move that distance so be aware of that <coughs> yeah I remember layback if we have to stop I remember Hans saying that before uh, to study the deep sea you would just drop a trolling net yes and just grab everything yeah. and just see what came up so we have come a really long way Yes, and not just for the deep sea, even if you look at terrestrial ecological practices and different kinds of studies, I always feel the goal and the motive should be that uh, it has to be as ethical as possible. And it can be, it is a very black and white place. It can be a very black and white place. Yeah, we have a lot of technological capabilities that, you know, the people that thought they were the first scientists yes. who would collect organisms. Uh, now we don't necessarily need Either. to do that exactly. and have a library when we can have digital libraries yes. and start to take eDNA samples, for Absolutely. example, um, which is a technology Push that is advancing as you know time progresses so that we can see what organisms live around in the area without taking them from their habitat. We again Good, have uh, bathy bathies, one of and there was another black coral which was probably a parantibathies. Or the lip at There's a small right, crinoid right. on the bamboo <coughs> that's right behind, and uh, there's this. I know that's not the sea star. Um, and yeah, I'll say I would also like to expand on. First of all, thank you for bringing the cultural significance of where we are up. Um, to expand on what you said more, we are in Papua Nau Mok Okea. Um, Push in there. which is one of the most important places and one of the most significant places to the Hawaiian people and we believe that um, Good, this thanks. is not only where we are born but it is where we return in our afterlife um, and that's why especially when in taking samples it is important to remember that in Hawaiian culture 
When we're okay, taking something, we are quite literally taking someone's ancestor with us as we go. Um, and we talked in our last shift how these samples can be um, put into museums and, you know, different scientists can use them. Um, and so you're quite literally taking somebody's ancestor away from its home. Um, and, you know, it's never going to return. So I think it's really important that we remember, um, for me as a native Hawaiian, remembering the importance of being here and for everybody else, um, also remembering that importance and just having respect for the land that we're on. Um, and I think that's, the Nautilus is so important because like they're not only um, down the hill there. bringing There's Hawaiians no, uh, into the conversation, but they're letting Native it's Hawaiians not a valley, lead it's just the a conversation step in while we're here. Um, and I think science re research can just not happen on indigenous land without indigenous knowledge. So, yeah, this place we're in is very important, and what we get to do is very special, and we're very lucky to be here. And we just need to remember that what we're taking um, we're just very lucky to be able to take what we get and that it has a lot of significance. Thank you so much for sharing that, Jaina. Yeah, I think that, thank you for expanding on that and I think that also puts it into more context for me that literally it's someone's ancestor that you, that we're looking at. So thank you for that. And Taylor Ann, can I ask, is there also something where um, these samples, once we're finished with them, they, I know we mentioned they go into the repository, but is it also um, they can be kind of brought back to Hawaii or something afterwards? Or, because I know that was maybe a... Um, so a great question. Um, yeah. So that's something that I've thought about quite a bit the last few years that we've been doing work here. Um, I think to truly be equitable, they should go to those museums and those repositories on Hawaii. Um, I think that's a conversation that we can start to have and see what the possibilities of that would be. At this point in time, I'm not sure. Um, if those conversations are being had and right if there are plans to, to make changes, um, but you know, as a science manager who pays a lot of attention to what OET does, that is something that I have thought a lot about. And I'm, I'm also sure that the, the people in leadership have been thinking about yeah. it as well. Yeah, um, yeah so, but there is the ability for anybody to request those samples right. from MCZ. Yeah. So it's not limited to just staying there, but oh, just, um, it is stored there. To US citizens no, well. yeah, it's open to anybody. From the world, they can access it. But uh, yes, there are two parts of it. Definitely, there should be more efforts of bringing or creating facilities and infrastructure so that samples can be housed and stored uh, and preserved in the places that they come from, in the, con in the uh, whatever is closest to that place. Say it, man, say it. Especially for, yeah, There's the sea star. There's a sea star. <laughs> <laughs> she said it. <laughs> oh, so last kind of pinkish. Yeah. What's that? I also think the landscapes that we are seeing are quite interesting because, as I said, this is a place where, for Native Hawaiians, where we are born and where we return for our death. And the last seamount that we saw was just so abundant and so full of life. And then this one is completely different, where yes, we're please. seeing a lot of death and not as much life as we did in the last seamount. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, quick zoom for us there, please. Uh, good, Jaina. thanks. <laughs> thanks for the Zoom, Jaina. You're welcome. Left or right? I think this is uh, one of the... Yes, yes, yeah. Uh, sorry, para-antipathies might be this little black coral we're seeing yeah. in the lower left. Is that a chrysogorgia or a the metallogorgia? Yeah. Oh, yeah, it looks... Chrysogorgid, definitely. It does look like a chrysogorgid, for sure. So either a chrysogorgia or a metallogorgia. 
If it has a long stalk, then it's a metallogorgia. Looks more metallogorgia. I'm not sure. That's probably the shadow. And this is another black coral. The this is this is also by antibacteries. This uh, bottle brush one. It's different from the darker one that we were seeing previously. Okay. I'm right under you now, Jacob. No, you're going to keep going north. We don't have any sediment cores from this expedition so far. Yeah, we attempted to take one in an area of coral hash, but um, there hasn't been very much mm. prime location to take a push core. Mm -hmm. We've been over a lot of hard yeah, sediment, or I mean hard substrate with some sediment cover, yeah, but probably hard rock underneath. Yeah. Thin sediment. There were two um, bathy bathies that we just crossed. I didn't see them. Uh, it's fine. We can continue oh. moving. I was just noted. Primnoid again, probably the Calyptrophora or Paracalyptrophora. That's a beautiful fan. It's a beautiful bamboo coral fan. Cool rock. Back to back these. Yep. I think we should pick it up. No, even if you stopped. Uh, yeah. There's a black coral. A couple of primnoid fans. Doesn't look like a cantaloupe. There's a crinoid on, on one of the bamboo coral fans. I'm pretty confident that we are going to get to waypoint two. That's good. Yeah, it's a very interesting pattern I think on so. the seafloor. We're just knocking those waypoints down now. Yeah. Mia gets paid by the waypoint. <laughs> <laughs> and, and by the, the sea, sea stars. stars. <laughs> and the sea stars. <laughs> They've been docking my pay since we haven't made. <laughs> Oh, there's another uh, macroridae. 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 Yeah, whatever you say. I, I'll, I'll, I'll <laughs> show you the spelling. Then it's easier. Uh, it, it doesn't help. I've looked at the spelling. Uh, the genus <laughs> is Corypheniides. Macroridae. Macroridae. <laughs> Macroridae. Okay, yes. I got it. Macroridae. C O R Y. Corypheniides. Yeah, thanks for that, Gina. I mean, you know, you know, as I do, and, and, and all of us, that in, in the you know modern academic training, all of these disciplines are so separated and pigeonholed: natural resources, cultural studies, historical studies, but. In truth, many people don't live like that, and these natural resources have c great cultural significance, and so those lines are crossed. But, but uh, 
the academic training doesn't reflect that, and it's it's hard to um, change that paradigm. I would add that uh, rather in the recent past, we have improved in the field of research and academia than how it had been in the last maybe 100, 200 years, where the before that it was considered as a common field of study, everything that it was uh, related. and But then there was this move to separate each uh, field of study and make them very distinct uh, subjects. But at least in the last 10 years, in at least some sections right. of scientists and researchers and academics there has been there is that at least recognition that everything is interdisciplinary and we cannot really make much progress if we just think that oh biology is yeah. separate and we are not going to talk I to the geologists or the archaeologists or the biochemists. I feel like we should stay on this trajectory. There is still a yeah, very, very well, long way to go. But at to least we are recognizing that. A section is recognizing that and that is that is something that also needs to be Yeah. Well, that's good. Glad to hear that. We're kind of we're traversing the steep part of the slope here pretty good. If you go left, you're going to Yeah. I feel not only now we're not changing the paradigm of science, but kind of what science looks like um of the people doing it. I feel like Absolutely. in history, you know, think of science, you think holly guy or holly girl in a white coat, not knowing that, you know, we've been doing science in the Pacific, our ancestors have been doing science since ever since, so. Yeah, that would not be recognized and yeah. only a certain, only if somebody fits certain, Take certain boxes, then only they would be considered as quick zoom on the bath exactly. or something there. So, here's a Coralidae or a heavy Coralidae on the right and a batty batty. I should have just said black one. <laughs> oh, I should have just said coral. <laughs> that one. You were right, that you one. ID'd that no. one. Yeah, you did. That's a bath batty, yeah. Yes, that's what it looks like. The same we're that we're we have. Light been years seeing away, I can't hold it still there. You do alternata or Maybe some one I of take the my hands which I think Tina suggested. Okay, go ahead, thanks. Um, Taylor Ann, just me. jumping in here real quick. Uh, we had a question about um, the eDNA research and if that um, is that something that they could get more information on, like the data once it's sequenced or do you know any more about that? Yeah, I'm not too sure the exact process, but I do know who we're collecting these samples in the library of eDNA4. Um, so you could look her up. Her name is Meredith Everett and she works for NOAA. Um, she, I've, yeah, I think she's been working with OET for quite a while, oh. um, doing building this eDNA library. Um, I'm not too sure, but yeah, everything that I think she does should be public information once it's sequenced. Um, but yeah, definitely look into to Meredith. Yeah, sometimes, uh, so there's Meredith Everett and there's a group of other researchers that collaborate with her. And what happens is that uh, can turn sometimes and look into the hill a little bit uh, if you want, Jacob. such data is uh, not made public till a publication is made. But with each pub, as soon as something is published and right. uh, as a uh, primary literature, the practice and the norm, rather not just a practice, the norm is that you have to make every piece of data used publicly okay, available. Like supporting files yes. and stuff supporting like files that. and yeah. stuff. Uh, mm -hmm. There are various free online repositories. Uh, I'm not sure if there's one specific for eDNA yet. I, I don't think there is, but they are made available in uh, freely accessible platforms sure. that anybody can access. So any right. data is always made. Any data related to such kind of work, whether it's eDNA or uh, genetics or genomics that we are working on, it's always, always made available. Great. Thank you. I'm sure our biochemist tuning in is appreciative of that information.
another one of those uh, Batty Batty's black corals among the bamboo coral fans. And as always, a non-zero chance of finding some interesting yes. historical wreck. Absolutely. It's a good thing I don't gamble. <laughs> <laughs> Gamble every time we put that ROV in the water. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of that, we checked the gauges and the set a timer. Are those hydraulic pressures? The gauges? Uh, sh uh, alt shift coolant. I, th I think uh, those are our uh, compensation circuits. Oh, okay. It's our basically our blood pressure. Okay. If it gets too high, that is not what we want. Uh, no, if it gets too low, we oh, okay. have bled to death and uh, okay. the lights go out in here. We did get a shout out to Dan earlier in the chat. So shout out to Dan and also everyone in the front row making everything happen, uh, yeah. navigating and flying, or sorry, operating. Thank you. <laughs> the ROV and um, making sure that we see everything. Bring your head to the right a little while you're doing that. I'm a biologist, but want to be ROV pilot and archaeologist, so I'm <laughs> not sure where my future is going to be. <laughs> well, probably in one of the seats in this room. So that's <laughs> yeah, I would uh, love to sit in all of them. Yeah. <laughs> I kind of want to be a biologist now, studying sea stars. Sea stars. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sea star it's expert. not too late, Mia. Too Remind late. me. Later, I will uh, show you uh, the work done by Krishma. You will, you will appreciate that. Yeah, it's never too late to have a career change, as I'm sure um, Hans has spoke about a couple of times. I mean, um, yeah, and I think that's really inspiring. I just had one major career change, so. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's possible though. You can, you know, later in life decide that. What you were doing is, you know, just not your passion, or that not you found your passion anymore. later. Yeah, yeah. and yeah. it's it's okay to like change also. Right at this point, if I'm interested in something, and yeah. then I spend years working on it, and then I can find something else, and I'm finding like so plankton. Yeah, uh, no, that's not going to happen. I had that. That's done. <laughs> no, I'm saying you used to do that, but no longer. Yeah. Yeah, but I wasn't passionate about it. I'm just making that point. <laughs> Something happened with zooplankton, and we c we shouldn't press her on it. Yeah, the plankton was a bane yeah. in her <laughs> I the black it. market. I her don't career. enjoy working under the microscope for hours. You don't have to right, tell us. Yeah. <laughs> Even we can tell. now, I. <laughs> I agree, though. As right. somebody who's done microplastics research, that is also not my my yeah. passion, but it's something that's very interesting. Interesting, and, absolutely. Um, absolutely. Yeah, but. You never know until you find out, right? Yeah. You gotta try. Absolutely. I enjoyed the field component of my research, the other analyses, the understanding of the field, but it's just that I do not enjoy working under the microscope much. A bit is absolutely fun. No, it's fine. Uh, I 
can tell you that up the hill is that way. So it's pretty benign. I mean, it's steep there, but it, it, well, it doesn't. It doesn't matter. You can move towards the waypoint. It's not boring. It's uh, side hilling is actually challenging. It's easier to go up the hill than along the side of it, but we're doing we're doing all right. There's nothing radical trying to reach out and grab us. Yeah, that's fine. Roger. Don't we get a rock here though? If we see any free angular rocks available that um, would offer themselves to us, yes. I'm not sure these look too angular. Doesn't matter because we're light years away from the ship. You can keep moving. Yeah, Val's instructions, but 2,200 meters depth. We're not there yet, but... Um, oh, 2,200 meters. Sorry, I thought we'd get one at the waypoint. Yeah, she said 2,200, but are, are we are we light? No, we're good. Okay. Master Jake has uh, dialed us in here. Gotcha. We'll be uh, probably more selective on the rock sizes. So. We hit the waypoint. Thanks for the announcement, <laughs> Mia. That is an achievement for this. Yeah, I wish that happened over every waypoint. <laughs> just like. Or if we start at waypoints and just stay there and celebrate that we are at the waypoint. I thought it was going to be nicer. <laughs> the save point. Oh, the save point. <laughs> you know, save the game, go yeah. back later. <laughs> Do you want to hear my impression of a waypoint meeting? <laughs> a bunch of scientists standing around looking at colored pixels and lines on a map, and <laughs> Rennie moves the mouse around, and they say, sure, that looks good. <laughs> <laughs> I've been in a, more than a few of them. <laughs> we actually aren't exactly on the waypoint. We're a little, a few meters away, but, you know, I count it as... It's the same. I wish I could see your face during those meetings. <laughs> <laughs> Don't pull the curtain back imagine. too far. <laughs> <laughs> the resolution at this depth is um, larger than Nautilus. What is it, Matt? Is it 100 meter resolution here? We've been trying to do 75. I don't know if we were able to do that for this one, but yeah. So Nautilus is 68 meters. Oh, wow. Actually, so I can measure a square here. Nautilus is a pixel on a map. I've got an important question for you, Dan, because I like the analogy and, and uh, I want to figure out the length of the carrier. The angel hair pasta, <laughs> what, what was the assumed diameter of the angel hair pasta? So my friend, who's a mathematician, also named Hans, did a lot. Oh yeah. He delved deep into that. When I have time, I can share you that information. You have that? He, he got two data points. Uh, one was a little larger than 6.8, and one was a little smaller. So he basically moved the decimal point uh, one place. So I added a zero before the 0.68. I think he settled on 071 or something like that. Uh, pretty close to uh, just moving a decimal point. Mm. Yep, ready, ready. Which I'm not sure uh, if he just moved the decimal point 
Well, that doesn't work because we're in, in that case, we're in inch meters, right? <coughs> yeah. Because uh, the diameter is in inches and the depth is in. Uh, well, you must have converted. No, that was about right. Yeah, so we were 2,500 something meters at that point. Or, no, we were at 5,000 meters. Yeah. And he came up with a 200 meter length at uh, zero decimal, uh, decimal zero seven one, I think it was what, what he picked there. And seven three or something like that. It's pretty close to. We had a viewer asking. Um, huh? Point eight three. You were asking um, for a little more clarification on what we were saying regarding waypoints. So um, that's W A Y P O I N T waypoint, not wait point. And um, basically, it's just um, markings right. along the map um, for this particular path that we're taking up the seamount. Um, so throughout this particular trail we have for this dive 10 waypoints leading from the bottom of this seamount up um, up in elevation towards the top of it. Um, anything you would like to add about waypoints? Yeah. Yeah, it's just it's a position on the transit that we're making that's yeah. called out as, you know, there might be a, a change in, in, in heading at a waypoint or at a certain elevation, so it just marks our entire transit up the ridge into segments mm -hmm. so we yeah. kind of can gauge our our progress right kind of like milestones or like yeah well, they um they typically attempt to follow the ridge line yeah mm. and um then we often uh, and then the waypoints are spread out to have a representative uh overall of the dive track mm-hmm and a lot of times we, uh, so if we are following a ridge, depending on uh, what we're seeing, we'll go to one side or the other to, um, depending on what the current's doing or what the local conditions are when we, hmm. and what the, uh, what the interest is of the, uh, yep. of the group, so. Yep. Uh, in this case, to get a representation of the different geology and, of course, the, the animals. Yep. So for this dive, there are, are 10 waypoints marking the, the, our transit from our point of descent to the point where we'll come off the bottom. And that way, I, we, when we change watch, Val can say something like, yeah, get above waypoint mm, three, put in, yeah. take another this or that or you know we're still between waypoint seven and eight so right it helps communicate um our progress on the path yeah there oh i was going to ask do you know uh, how long this dive is going to be 24, uh, 24 hours, hours 24 yeah. hours so on deck tomorrow at 8 p.m the, the other consideration is um how uh several considerations but um one of them is you obviously get a better visual from the ROV if it's going uphill. So they try and start at the deep end and go uphill because mm. uh, the it's just like if you're walking down a hill, it's harder to see <laughs> as if you're walking up right. a hill because the camera's closer to the to the seabed. And um, they also take into consideration how the ship will have to move during the during the dive track. So what the prevailing uh, wind and waves are, uh, Nautilus can uh, move forward and backwards better than it can sideways. So if the weather's excessive, it's kind of limited to move sideways. And then also they try not to pick uh, anything. Yes, please. Uh, where we're in a, for example, if the ship loses power or position or the ROV loses telemetry, um, where we're not in a blow-on situation where we'll drift up against a, a cliff. So there, there's actually a lot of uh, logistical 
considerations as well as the scientific objectives during those meetings. I think if you guys look at the dive plan, there are a few images that have, I mean, they're trying to show the 3D representation on, you know, 2D. Mm -hmm. But you can see it, uh, I was in their map when we were getting this data, and it's similar to the shape from the last time, where it was kind of like a, I don't want to say caldera, because that's a specific term, and Val would probably be like, no, that's not what it is. But uh, it's just a different, it looks more collapsed on the other side, just like yesterday. So we're going along that part, like the upper part of that, um, if you if you look at that in the dive plan. I know viewers at home can't see it, but. Um, and then the next picture has the perspective of the, the view of the planned dive track. Yeah, well, I'm sure she'd be calling out areas that looked like there was collapse or areas of geologic interest, yeah. Yeah, it's a balanced uh, geologic interest, and in, um, we're pretty good at predicting where the corals and sponges are not, but we're still, um, it's still an educated guess on where they are. We've been really fortunate the last couple of dives to have the diversity that we do. Uh, it's not, we're not always so lucky. Can you explain a little bit how you know where they're not? Uh, no, that's way above my <laughs> pay grade. <laughs> um, Thank you. <laughs> it, I know in some of the general terms, um, some of the things they take into account are they try and determine um, from the backscatter that it's uh, rock and not mud. Obviously, the corals like the you know the rocky substrate. Right, right. Thank you, everyone, for your helpful answers. Um, our viewer also just wanted to say thank you, and um, they're watching with uh, potentially other members of their STEAM club, their science, technology, engineering, um, art, and mathematics club. So uh, thanks for your great question, too. How'd that happen? Hmm. Too much talking, not enough flying on my part. Ah, uh, no, we're good. I'll get back in the box here. Sure. You can, uh, oh no, you can't come down. Yeah, sorry, I naturally go up the hill and I wasn't looking at my instruments there. Um, we also had a question from a viewer um, who works with children and um, kind of helping them figure out what they want to be as they grow up. Um, and they were wondering, uh, are you doing what you thought you would be doing when you were kids? Um, what's the most exciting thing you could tell a kid version of yourself about what you're doing now? Does anyone want to share? Like, um, did you think you'd be doing this as a kid? Sure. Um, I definitely did not even know this was a career as a kid. I didn't even know you could be a scientist, honestly. I never knew anyone around me that was a scientist. Uh, nobody went to college in my family, um, at least not for a science like this. Um, What's that mean? And as a kid, I always loved exploring like outside, said? though. Um, so I always knew I wanted to do something like that. I just didn't know you could do get paid for it. Um, and I didn't figure out what I wanted to do until college, actually. I flipped around with different majors a couple of times my first year, um, from pre-veterinary science to telecommunications to biology 
Um, and I guess the way I just kind of found that out was seeking out my passions, the things that made my heart feel full. So like watching documentaries about the ocean and just having that compassion to protect and conserve and save has always been there. Um, but yeah, I think the path kind of revealed itself as, you know, I kept pushing forward through the education system and kind of just Googling different uh, career paths that are out there. Um, and also the different people around me helped influence and teach me about the different careers that are possible. So I think it's really important Perfect. to have community and to be really yeah. transparent and open about what is out there and yeah. what kind of careers exist. Because if you don't know, you you don't know. Yeah. And there's so such a variety. So thank you so much for sharing that. That makes my heart feel full to hear that. <laughs> Anytime. Um, anyone else want to share what they thought they would be growing up? I can add a little bit. It's quite similar to what uh, Tehran just uh, described, uh, but in a more... Uh, I guess I was a child who wanted... When I was a kid, for a long while, all I wanted to do was become uh, Mowgli from Jungle Book. <laughs> so that was what I literally <laughs> wanted. And obviously as a kid you don't have the concept of a practical world where you need a job and you need a money, you need money to survive. And I think from, I just wanted to be sure. out in the wilderness, yeah. exploring, being with animals. Uh, I think yes, being with animals yeah, would be interesting easier to go I always to help. loved animals of every kind. Uh, learning more about different sorts of animals. When I say animals, it's not just like bigger mammals, but bugs, insects, fishes, everything. And obviously none of this was much encouraged. And because uh, it was, I mean, I guess most of my growing up years, even later, I've been mostly ridiculed for the choices that I've made and also the uh, options that I've chosen later on as well because like I said it's not considered as one of the most more secure jobs yeah. to have and everything and how can somebody just be like going around running around being in the mud looking <laughs> at things and uh, there's always a push for conventional education but as I grew up I figured that no this is where my interests lie and then it's all about figuring out the practicalities and figuring out how you can continue doing what you want or you can do what you want. It doesn't have to be a continuing thing. It can be something changing. And then navigating through the processes, through the systems, because unfortunately there's always a system in place. We just can't do what, because we want to do something, because as adults in a practical world, we need to have a job. We need to be earning money to survive. So, mm -hmm. and for that you need sometimes some degree of formal education. I don't believe that, uh, create naturalists only come out of formal education? No, not at all. Right, Some yeah. of the people that I know when I've met, they're working in with different people. Uh, they probably have never even been to a school, but they, the, the amount of knowledge they have of the forest and the habitat they live in, none of us can ever match that. Right. So it's all, so it's about, then it's about navigating the practical world and figuring it out. But I think for kids, it's, the first thing should be that do what you enjoy and it, as long as it's a constructive thing as long <laughs> as like, obviously not do what you enjoy it shouldn't involve hurting or harming anybody or just not doing something that is destructive in any way but mm -hmm. in a constructive way just right. enjoy and then you'll figure out what you want to do there doesn't have to be so much of pressure of knowing at uh, five at the age of five or ten that what you want to do with your life Oh, yeah. I echo that. Education systems are also very, very hard to exactly. exist in, yes. thrive in as people who the systems weren't designed to incorporate and to yes. support. Um, Absolutely. I personally have not enjoyed most of my experiences in, in school, but more so the hands-on experiences exactly. that I've gotten. Like being out Absolutely. here, I've learned so much more than I ever have in any classroom. Um, but I think, you know, whatever 
floats your boat. <laughs> um, yes. I be think, curious. Yeah. I think that's being most curious, important. Yeah. Be curious and exercise that curiosity mm -hmm. and explore. Exposure to yes. yeah. And can be any field. It can be anything. And just and continue like practicing and doing what you enjoy. Eventually, everybody figures it out. Yeah, and yeah, like you said, exploring also your different kinds of interests. Yes. And then having the ability to do so, which I know yeah. sometimes can be limited depending on the resources available um, to you. Yeah, I know for myself, I always, like everyone here, felt kind of like some kind of draw to the ocean, right, and, and nature in general. Um, and uh, I think if you look at my like six, sixth grade yearbook, it's like, what do you want to be when you grow up? It's like marine biologist. <laughs> um, but I did a... Uh, it's like eel. Oh. No, I passed by. <laughs> Sorry, Kara. Oh, no worries. I don't want to distract from the actual science going on here, too. <laughs> Um, but yeah, I think, um, uh, I also had, like, paintings, so, like, mm -hmm. because I couldn't go visit those places, really, um, I just, like, painted them, so I have, like, a bunch of deep sea paintings, actually, oh, of, like, anglerfish right. and oh. dragonfish right. from when I was, like, seven years old, yeah. and, like, I first learned about them in a book, and it was just like, oh my god, and I was just making a bunch yes. of paintings of them, and then, but it was kind of a question, like, will, uh, will I ever, like, get there? Um, and it's mm -hmm. definitely, marine science in general, I think, is very much like a pay-to-play world sometimes. Um, like, internships and stuff are not paid. Um, you do a lot of volunteer work. So a lot, a lot. Sometimes to get experience, it's like really like if you, if your f uh, family can afford to like send you to summer camp or something like that and those yeah. experiences. And it's difficult also the, because like most internships, at least like back in India and everything, they weren't paid, but it's difficult to sustain and continue within that. And yeah. that is a practice that I hope gradually changes and that recognizing that it shouldn't be how it is. So right, yeah. yeah. And yeah. I'm seeing more paid internship nowadays. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And Absolutely. if I'm ever allowed to like comment on program design, then I'm like, you really should be Absolutely. paying the interns. Absolutely. Otherwise, yeah. the only people that can afford to do the internship Who are people. Have, exactly. Yeah. 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 Already coming, you're already biasing the pool that you're getting the interns yeah. from. More I've financial. had many personal experiences with being offered internships and different states that were honestly really great opportunities. But I was I, so yeah. sad I couldn't do but because couldn't they wouldn't pay, exactly. they wouldn't um, yeah. pay for me to relocate, they wouldn't pay for housing, anything. Yeah, so it's like, same. if your, you know, parents have a lot of money to support you, that's great. But you know, yeah. if you don't, yeah. So I think that's why it's really important that organizations like OET exist and that they, they make sure of, you know, paying their interns and yeah. that that's really, really important that really does make it possible for more people to, to break into this right. world that's yeah. super competitive and it, it shouldn't be. We should it all have equal be. access to, to, you know, explore our interests. Yeah, and I'm also really passionate about public education, like really well-funded public education because otherwise, again, it's like Absolutely. what you pay for, right? So, yeah, yeah but, but happy to be here now. If yes. I had any advice, it would be like, it, you know, just take, it might take a long time, it take <laughs> many a long years, time, but I mean. um, yeah, just like keep doing yeah. what you're interested in and maybe you'll get there. Yeah, and also it's about that, don't be disheartened if yeah. things don't work out yeah. the first time. Mm -hmm. They never have for me and they never will. Like, yeah. I know it, it doesn't work out that, but it's also about uh, just sticking to what you like and continuing and yeah the internships that's very important there have been so many great internships that I could not go for and uh, sometimes I feel that if I had the means to do those probably it would have worked out differently things would have but that's the truth of it so yeah Opashina, you're just a little bit quiet oh. 
Sorry. <laughs> no, no, no. Thank you for the reminder. But to actually answer your question, I think for children, exposure yeah. is really important. So the ship to shore interactions we do are just yeah. incredible. I know mm -hmm. I substitute taught for an inner city school across the street from where I grew up and went mm -hmm. to school um, in this town called Chicago Heights. And most of the kids there have never probably been to the beach, let alone the ocean. Right. So never seen a lake. But I got to bring, you know, my experiences from OET there and see their faces light up and like That's to awesome. even know that something like that exists and that they looked like me and that they could even potentially be like me in the exactly. future. So that exposure and actually that visual and that representation, um, trying to, yeah, find those resources for, for young kids, I think is really, really, important. really important. Um, I know I didn't see any of that growing up. I think most of the representation I saw that looked like me was maybe Beyonce when I was a kid, so I grew up <laughs> wanting to be Beyonce. Like, <laughs> I'm still obsessed to her, uh, with her <laughs> to this day. Um, but yeah, I think we need to be able to see each other in these different roles and um, diversity and inclusion really does matter. Yeah. Um, and not just, you know, for performative purposes, but to actually interweave, inter yeah, intertwine each other's like belief systems and yes. cultural practices um, and, and just yeah collaborate rather than you know separate each other by differences because yeah. those differences are honestly the key to understanding um, yeah, yeah. making sure all these working Absolutely. spaces are like inclusive and you know like a like a place where we can all like share and be ourselves is really yeah. important yeah 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 it's important to be able to identify um, uh, connect with people in different areas of work. Otherwise, it just seems that, oh, that's not for me. That shouldn't ever be the case. It's very important to be able to connect and identify oneself with yeah. people working in different fields. And I just oops, sorry. If anyone wants to sign up for a ship to shore, yes. <laughs> we are um, we have our form still open, and you um, can still sign up for a time. Uh, they're typically 30 minutes, um, and any audience any audiences are welcome. Um, they're open to any age group, um, and we can share what we're doing on the Nautilus, share about different careers, um, talk about all our different amazing technology and. Um, work going on on the Nautilus. So, um, if that's something that would be helpful for you, any your STEAM club, um, your students, um, your you know biology club or something like that, feel free to sign up for that. Um, it's totally free and uh, easy to sign up on Google Forms. Yep, absolutely. And uh, since we are nearing the end of our shift, there's a quick recap. We have been. Uh, gradually climbing up uh, an unnamed sea mount and um, we have been mostly seeing bamboo corals, uh, keratoisids, uh, probably uh, some there are some uh, variations in the bamboo coral fans that we have been observing. Uh, one of the kind seemed to be in the genus Echnomyces and the other probably what is called the bee clade. Uh, we have also been seeing some bam uh, some black corals, mostly batipathies, uh, a few uh, parentipathies of two different uh, kinds, and uh, and then there were some corallids, but not a lot. Uh, we also saw some uh, dead uh, bamboo coral stalks and fallen down branches, some sea stars. Uh, there was a there was a stretch of a couple of meters when we saw quite high abundance of brisingid seasars as well, uh, some hydroids, uh, and unfortunately, an evidence of a f trawling net or a fishing net. So that's how it ha mostly has been in the last couple of hours. Yeah, well, it looked like that net drifted in. It doesn't look like that was being used yes. here or anything. Yes. That was a. That was a drifter. That's a ghost net. Yeah. Just a portion, just a small yes. portion. Yes. But it's a fact of the Pacific. Absolutely. That there's uh, a lot of it drifting around exactly. out there. And I forgot to mention the fishes. So we have been, uh, we saw 
a couple of uh, Coryphenoides uh, macrourids and one or two Halosaurids as well. Uh, I think that more or less encompasses everything that we saw. Well, that was a spooky bamboo yeah. forest. <laughs> oh, yeah, 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 uh, yeah. You know, we've been climbing a spooky bamboo exactly, forest bridge. Exactly, a spooky ba bamboo, yeah. spooky bamboo coral forest. <laughs> yeah, that was a great summary. Thank yeah. you, <laughs> Yeah, that was great. <laughs> All right, thanks so much for that summary, Pashna. Thank you. Yeah. Yep, we're up above 2,297 meters. Yeah. Looking uh, towards a shift change, watch change here pretty soon. Yeah, I think we started at around 2,410 meters. So we have climbed quite a distance. And thank you to our audience from all around the world that tuned in um, from the US, Japan, UK, Canada, Germany, Finland, Australia, Singapore, Portugal, France, Switzerland, and Belgium. Um, we are going to continue this dive until um, 8 p.m. Hawaii time tomorrow, so there's still plenty more to explore. Um, and thank you so much for joining us, and feel free to keep uh, sending us your comments and questions in the chat box, and once we complete the watch change... Oh, what's um, that? Swimming across. Oh, uh, went away. Maybe <laughs> a very, very small jellyfish. Oh. Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe there'll be more small jellyfish, so definitely stay tuned. <laughs> it's great to have the countries tuning in, the, the distribution. Yeah. And, yeah. and today we had so many more, um, I mean, we always have a lot of countries, but especially long list today, so that yeah. was really awesome. And, I, and I, I miss that Hawker Food Center culture in Singapore, <laughs> I've got to say, the, the diversity of food there. The diversity, remarkable. the quality. And the culture oh, yeah. of the, the Hawker taste. centers. Yeah. yeah, really amazing. So, so Derek's here to relieve me. Um, great watch, everyone. Thanks, I'll see Mia. you for the next one after I get some sleep and yeah. food. <laughs> Thanks, Mia. Thanks, Good, Mia. Night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Yep. Thank you, front row. Thank you, middle watch. Dead man's watch. <laughs> we'll stand by to be relieved. People are coming in now. Yeah. Yes. Oh, get some rest. Don't forget to check out the stars maybe before you Yes, I you will. Uh, model. <laughs> but I will need some help identifying stars. Oh, I don't know how to identify them. I just Cassiopeia, like looking at them. <laughs> Ursa Major, and I think Canis Major. and We'll see. <laughs> but I'll have a look at that when I get up.
uh, front row signing off. Thank you, everyone. See you, Daniel. Videos on comms. I'm ready. Morning, guys. Hey. Can you hear me now? Yeah. I was thinking um, maybe just tracking a line at towards waypoint three at zero point four. Yeah, love it. I mean, apparently they haven't seen a lot of. Uh, much on these uh, waypoints, so yeah, I think moving along uh, would give us more time if we do see something later. Uh, all my instructions were sometimes shallower than 2200. We're going to do a rock sample if we can find one, because currently we couldn't take a rock sample. So that's, uh, yeah, that sounds great to me. All right. Thanks. Sure. Test set one, two, three, rec one, rec two, rec three, rec four, check, check. Check, check. Is this thing on? One, two, one, two. Welcome to today's I, yeah, assembly. Yeah. Bridge nav. Good morning. Could we please track a line bearing 308 at 0 0.4 knots? Three zero eight. Three zero eight. At 0 0.4 knots. Uh. Oh. Uh. Thank you, Bridge. Tito, do you want me to force talk you again so you can hear me even when you're not listening? You good? Now I'm off of there, so you should still hear me.
Good morning, everyone. So we are on dive H2005 um, on another unnamed seamount. This one's number 11. So I guess that's kind of named. <laughs> um, last two watches got for, from our launch point to waypoint one and waypoint two, and we're about halfway to waypoint three. Once we get above 2,200 meters, what are we now? Okay, we're at 2,300. Um, we'll probably look to take another rock sample, but we're going to be getting the ship moving, tracking a line to waypoint three so that we uh, pick up the pace a little bit, save time if we find something cool that we can uh, slow down. But uh, it's been pretty flat rock surface, and from what I understand, that's been pretty consistent this dive no, we, without the sort of coral forest we saw in the last seamount so yeah we're going to pick up the pace a little bit and uh, see if we can find some more things uh, a little shallower good morning can you hear me okay yep awesome thanks for that update um i was just getting um, updated by our last communications person about some of the conversations in the van and these comments are so sweet and are making me so happy. <laughs> um, uh, it looks like uh, folks are talking about careers and kind of if they ended up where they thought they were. Um, so I thought it would be nice if uh, for our introductions for our watch um, we'll share a little bit about ourselves, where we came from, and then uh, if you don't mind, can you tell us if you're doing what you thought you were going to be doing when you were little. So, good morning everyone. My name is Tori Hunt, um, and I'm a high school science teacher, and this is my very first time sailing on an exploration vessel. Um, and I'll be honest, when I was little, I was obsessed with all things ocean and all things sharks, and um, I kind of thought the only way I could get out here to the ocean was by like becoming a marine biologist, and I found passions in education and still science, but, um, Honestly, this is kind of what I wanted to be doing when I was little, so I'm very grateful for this experience and that I also get to teach and still be part of education. So yeah, very cool. Malia, what about you? Yeah, so aloha mai kako o Malia Evans ko u inoa no hilo mai yau. Um, so my name is Malia Evans. Um, I work as an education and outreach coordinator on behalf of uh, NOAA for the Papahanao Mokoakea. Um, did my mic just go out? No, I, oh, we hear you. Okay, mm -hmm. okay. Um, for the Papahanao Mokoakea Marine National Monument. And um, I am from Hilo, born and raised in Hilo, um, also raised on Oahu in Hawaii. And um, yeah, I've kind of taken a, a very sir, circular route to get to where I am at. Um, I noticed someone in the chat had asked about whether if our careers are working kind of contributed um, or not. And I would have to say that work experience is so invaluable. Um, I didn't go to college until later in life, like when I was in my late 30s. And that work experience and that lived experience really um, helped me to focus on what I wanted. So I'm actually doing what I've always wanted to do. Since I was young, I wanted to be an archeologist. And so um, that was part of my journey, was um, getting my degree in archeology. span But I really found that I loved ethnography more, which is really a study of living culture. And that living culture is my own culture, which is a Hawaiian culture. So um, yeah, I would say I'm doing what I love to do. I get to hang out with amazing people, um, learn from them as we um, go through this expedition and really learn from the, the, the ocean, um, which is the greatest teacher to me. So, mahalo nui, glad all of you could join us. And I will pass it on to Mike. Hey everyone, uh, Mike Brennan. I'm a maritime archeologist with Search Inc. Um, and the co-lead co co -lead scientist for this expedition. Um, and yeah, I, I'm, I'm strangely doing <laughs> exactly what I, I wanted to do uh, when I was uh, around eight, uh, eight or nine, fourth grade. Um, my parents brought my brothers and I to Woods Hole, um, where we saw kind of like a small museum that they had there, which included um, the video of Ballard's uh, discovery of Bismarck, and that was kind of like, you know, my entry into into marine archaeology. 
decided that I wanted to do that sort of stuff. And, um, you know, I, I ended up going to grad school with, with Dr. Ballard um, and working for Nautilus and now, now I work for a, a archaeology company. And then here I am back on Nautilus. So, um, yeah, it's been a, a whole bunch of amazing um, opportunities strung together. Um, and I'm, I'm really glad to be back on Nautilus doing this and continuing to do this sort of stuff. Awesome, thank you for sharing that, Mike. I Honestly, I love hearing everyone's stories and just kind of figuring out how everyone got to this point, how many times they've sailed before. This is like one of my favorite conversations that we have. Hannah, what about you? Yeah, hi, I'm Hannah Parody. I'm a geologist and I'm part of the science team, science and data team, and I'm a grad student at CSULB, so California State University, Long Beach, and how I got into geology or where I am right now, uh, well, in when I was younger, I wanted to be a um, a vet, so <laughs> that's probably the most basic thing that every little girl wanted to be, but that's what I wanted to be. And then when I got a little bit older, I wanted to be a gynecologist. But um, yeah, so th I am definitely <laughs> like, Somewhere I would not have been if I wasn't, if I didn't go to LSU, because I would not have ended up in geology. <laughs> yeah. Tell us the story cool. of um, when you started at LSU, you weren't starting in geology, right? No, I yeah. wasn't. I started in as a biologist, and then, like I've said before, um, I went to orientation for the College of Science, and every college did their presentation. and. But when geology went, right after I was like, okay, that's what I want to do. <laughs> and so then I went up to the College of Science president and I was like, is there a way that I can change my major from biology to geology? And she was like, yeah, go sit with the geologist. And then it was just me and another geologist. <laughs> and we actually were the only two that like graduated from <laughs> geology from my year. So uh, yeah, it was really, it was really fun. But I need to, I need to ask, um, <laughs> like what, what, uh, was it in the presentation that hooked you? Like, do you know where they're talking about volcanoes? Was it yeah. rocks? Was it mineral? Like, what was it? Do you remember the, the moment that it happened? Yeah, so they talked about field trips. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> no, that's totally fair. Yeah, you yeah, said yeah. that you wanted to yeah. travel. Yes, wanted I wanted yeah, to travel fair. and do science. And I was yeah. like, okay, so they're like go actually going places. And I was like, I will be going there. <laughs> I will be doing that. That's so. cool. Well, look at you now. Yeah, no. If I would have told, I guess, my senior in high school self yeah. would actually be, like, freaking out. That's – and the, I'm still freaking out. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. But, like, my younger self, no. I, I wanted to be a vet and a gynecologist for some, some reason. <laughs> I think <laughs> – I don't know why. But, uh, well, because I guess because I really loved animals. So, yeah, that, that's it. <laughs> See, I would have been drawn to that major at your school just because of the...